speaker for the session is Dr. G. Rajalakshmi. She is a scientist at Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, Hyderabad. Her prime interests are in developing experimental techniques for probing fundamental aspects of science. She has built experiments for precision measurements of gravity and other fundamental interaction, employing torsion balances, laser-cooled atoms, and the optical interferometers. She finished her PhD in experimental gravitation from the Indian Institute of Astrophysics. In TIFR, she has been working on experiments on spectroscopy of low temperature atoms. Uh, gravitational wave detection using LIGO interferometers and using recently uh, nuclear magnetic resonance and atomic magnetometry and the title for her today's talk is quantum sensors of magnetic fields please welcome dr uh, rajalakshmi yeah so thanks urvasi for inviting me to speak here it's a nice to see so many nice young faces in optics that's nice uh, it will be technical i will try to be simple please stop me and ask questions if i if you think i'm saying things which are beyond what I'm supposed to be saying. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, as, as we were saying, I'm going to talk about uh, quantum sensors for magnetic fields. So, Urvashi told me to talk about quantum sensors. I'm sticking to magnetic fields because I'm more familiar with them. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so, when we think about quantum metrology for doing, measure, measuring magnetic fields, there are already many sensors in the market available. And when we're talking about, look, Magnetic fields of, with quantum sensors, what we are th talking of are fields in the very low range from femto Tesla to pico Teslas. And there are several quantum sensors available which have been the uh, magnetoresistive sensors, Hall effect sensors have been around for a long time and these are like used every day almost, our phones have them. So of course they don't go up to femto Tesla, they go quite low. Squids have been the main uh, peep, uh, hall classes so far in the Fibro Tesla to Pico Tesla region, but of late these two candidates have also come into place and they are giving their fight to squids. So just to summarize, so as I, I mentioned the same things which were there, we just plotted all of them here. So there are two things when you're talking about sensing, one is measuring low fields and the other is also imaging in the sense that if I want to take an image of a magnetic field, what is the smallest resolution I can get? So, so this sensitivity is on this axis, the linear dimension or the resolution is on this axis. So if you can see NV centers do the best in terms of resolution but not so much in terms of sensitivity. And the most sensitive detectors are actually, SURF is also atomic magnetometer. So atomic magnetometers and squid are the most sensitive detectors. So I'll basically be talking about atomic magnetometers today. So, in our lab, we have two kinds of atomic magnetometers. Actually, sorry, I think in the first slides, I forgot to acknowledge people. I'll go back in the lens and maybe I'll do that. Sorry. Uh, so, yeah, so uh, there are lots of things that are happening in the lab. But today, I'll be talking about uh, two systems. So, so I'll be basically talk about two uh, works. Uh, both are looking at sensing magnetic fields using atomic sensors. One uses the very popularly known method called optical pumping, which has been around since 1960s, even before lasers. Uh, but uh, the other techniques is something which we are developing new, where we are talking about mixing between magnetic and electric fields, which, and uh, the, the field which mixes with the electric field is what we will detect. And the mixing medium in both cases is the atomic medium, which is rubidium. So just for people who have not seen these things before, so when you look at an atomic medium, you have, I'm sure you've all, familiar with the fact that there are ground states and excited states of atoms. So the for rubidium, which is an alkali, the ground state is 5s level and the first excited state is 5p and there is also, yeah. And there are, this is a, so for alkalis, everybody is familiar with the D1 and D2 line. Sodium, everybody I think is more familiar with, but all alkalis have them. We're talking about the D2 line, which is uh, P3 by 2 and this is half. So, this is a fine structure which is basically interaction of the electron with its own spin and then the interaction of the electron spin, the J of the atom with the nuclear spin gives rise to further splitting of the spectral line and these are the two ground states and these are the two excited states. So there is transitions possible between the ground state and the excited state. There are two isotopes of rubidium 
I put both of them here because for one of the experiments, the optical pumping experiments I am talking about, we are using this isotope, though both the experiments can be done with the 87, but for the other one we are using the 87 isotope because there this is more important. I won't go into the detail, anybody who wants to know more details can come and talk to me. This is just to familiarize. So, so there are two ground states and one excited states and this is what we will be usually be using. Then what we are going to be using is in the presence of magnetic field, this uh, the ground state will start splitting because of Zeeman and that is what we will use to address. So what do we mean by the optical pumping? So we have, let's say we have a system which has two ground state and one excited state. Typically in the thermal uh, equilibrium, both the ground states will be equally populated. The differences between them will be very small because the energy difference between them is much larger than the thermal wavelength. So typically both the, both the ground state by Boltzmann distribution will be equally populated. Now I bring in a particular light in such a way that it excites atoms here and the, when they de-excite they will fall to both. But I am continuously exciting from this level. So eventually what will happen is that more of them will land up here and this ground state will have less atoms. Now if let us say but for some reason one of them can only absorb one particular polarization of light, let us say circular, pol light circularly polarized in one direction and other can absorb light polarized only in the other direction, then if I send a linear polarized light which can be thought of as a combination of two circular components, what will happen is that one component will get more absorbed and the other component will get less absorbed which will lead to differential absorption and optical rotation. This is the simplistic way to see this but of course one can actually calculate this by going into something like that. So, we do not need to go into the details, but what you all you will know is that you have to write down the Hamiltonian of the system. You will have H0 which is basically the atomic Hamiltonian, just like everybody would have done the hydrogen atom. Now you have to do it for the rubidium atom, you have to write the whole Hamiltonian. And then you have the light which will be the He which is the electric field of light interacting with the atom which will lead to this term. And then the magnetic field of uh, which will uh, external field that you apply will give rise to a Zeeman kind of an interaction. So these are the two, three terms. So you kind of look at the interaction of the light and the atom using this Hamiltonian and the standard approach for these kinds of things is what is called as a density, uh, density matrix approach where you then propagate this and basically measure what you called as atomic polarizability which is basically the difference in population created. So idea is now okay, first create this polarizability and then now send light through this polarized medium and see what happens to that light. So you do all this and then you can estimate, okay. So what do you get? I measure how much is the optical rotation if I send in a linearly polarized light. So that is this plotted here and I study that as a function of magnetic field because that is what I want to sense. And then I try to see what is the region on this is the uh, laser wavelength. So you just make a study and find out what is the wavelength of light which gives me maximum signal of optical rotation for a given magnetic field. So that, that tells me that is the laser light frequency I need to use. Similarly, since we are talking about optical pumping, uh, you can imagine the more intensity, more atoms will get excited, more, uh, more light available for absorption. So you also study as a function of intensity, what is the sensitivity to magnetic field and then you see in terms of intensity, if you look at it, the sensitivity keep increasing up to some point and beyond that it starts to fall. So there is an optimal intensity which is given by some number. So this is, this is what the theory tells us. Now we go ahead and do the experiment and see what happens in the experiment. So the experiment itself is pretty simple. You have a laser, you have some beam sitter which takes a little bit of light out to go and do some spectroscopy to make sure what is the laser frequency I have. And then the rest of the light we go through, send it through a linear polarizer, then send it through your atomic vapor. After that you have what is called as a Wollaston prism which basically separates the two horizontal components and horizontal and vertical components of polarization and that falls on a difference detector and the difference is directly proportional to the optical rotation. You adjust initially the linear polarizer such that when the, in the absence of any magnetic field and anything there is equal light falling on the system and when some change happens there will be a difference will change, the difference is directly proportional to the rotation. So now if you plot that as a function of magnetic field. And what you are doing here, exactly what we did in the theory, what are we doing? We just change the laser frequency across the atomic spe absorption spectra and then we study and we see that this pink line which is the, when the laser is here, 
which is on resonance with one particular transition is when we have the maximum signal. So for a given magnetic field, I have the maximum signal along this curve. So that is a good place to go keep my laser locked. And then what is the intensity which I should use if I want to get good sensitivity. So we again do the same experiment as a function of intensity and then you see as we keep increasing the intensity initially, the signal gets better up to 2 but then 4 and 8 are worse than 2. So 2 milliwatt is a good power to use, so keep that and then go and look at other studies. So what is that? So what are the main features I want to look at? So I am looking at what is the back sensitivity I have and so what do we get? I am able to get a sensitivity of about a pico tesla over a range of frequency up to about 50 kilohertz. So that is the interesting thing about it. And what are what is the uh, main noise source? Initially one thought maybe it is basically electronic noise. Then we see that no, when there is no light falling on the system, the noise level is very low, it is not electronic. The noise is basically coming from the photodetector. Moment some light starts to fall on the photodetector, that's where the noise floor goes up. And so my main limitation right now is coming because of photon short noise the coming from, from the photodetector. So that's one thing. So given that we are able to achieve this. And the interesting thing about our detect our uh, magnetometer is that so this pink curve is when I mean I want to measure low fields, but I'm talking about here pico teslas and femto teslas. The earth field is micro tesla. So how do I measure pico tesla when I put my magnetometer in a micro tesla? Most magnetometers will get swamped, but our, what we have seen is that if you don't even if I put it in a nice shielded environment so that the magnetometer sees only nano tesla background field. We have very good sensitivity, but even if I use unshielded environment, the sensitivity only drops by about a half. So I can still use my the magnetometer even in earth field kind of a configuration without too much problems. So okay, this is just a basic comparison. I, I mean basically there are commercial magnetometers already available which are good in terms of sensitivity. They work, but they work only in background fields of about 50 nano tesla and they are very work with uh, vapors which are very hot and their bandwidth is usually limited to 100 hertz. As opposed to all of these, they have femto tesla sensitivity though, so there they beat us. So we have about a pico tesla sensitivity but we have a very high dynamic range in the sense that I can me measure it even in earth fields which they can, those things cannot do and we have a bandwidth which is very large. So that is the main thing. So what do we do with this? We use this to do what are called zero field NMR experiments where we measure NMR inside a very shielded box here. So you initially put the sample inside a magnet here which is homemade, which is about 0.5 tesla, very small and tiny and then you quickly shuttle the sample down to this and you and then you detect the rotation of the uh, spin by using the atomic magnetometer. So this is basically water sample which you shuttle and you measure the what is called as a free induction decay or the polarization relaxation of water in low fields and we do it by changing the field and we can see that there is a signal. So we are able to detect the uh, NMR signals from water samples with our setup. And the other thing we do with these experiment is a little bit crazy. What we do is to use these magnetometers to measure the uh, state of the battery, ba to in situ <laughs> diagnosis of batteries to see how good is my lithium battery. Is it failing or is it about to fail and things like that. So a bit crazy. Uh, so we basically well, it's interesting that the lithium spin, the charge state and the uncharged state of lithium batteries have different magnetization. So you just mag look, study the magnetization and as you, if you can, I don't know, make out. So if you look at these lines here, so basically the difference in the, this is uh, when it is in near, the, when the sensor is near on and sensor is on and sensor is off. So there is a small change in the magnetization and th this change gets worse when the battery gets bad. So you can actually study the difference in the magnetization state and no, unstate this, this one, this, this jump for example, this is this jump between the charge state and discharge state is much larger for a bad battery. So when the, so if you, you know that the battery is getting bad by when this happens and then you can go on do various things. So that is some crazy thing but we are trying with that. So th this is the other magnetometer I spoke about. I, no, I have time, so it's okay. I don't. Am I rushing too fast? Huh? Yeah. So basically, the this this is a little bit slightly different system. So already Joy and others spoke about Kai two. 
which is this term here which they were talking about when they were generating the uh, twin pin photons which is basically this is chi 2 in the sense that two electric fields uh, sorry chi 2 which where the two electric fields mix to generate sorry this one sorry you you had this two electric field mix to generate a third one but i have a slightly different system where i have one electric field mixing with a magnetic field to generate polarization or one electric field mixing with two magnetic fields to generate a polarization how do i generate this again i use the same atomic system so we are now looking at only the f level so the ground state as i said in the presence of uh, uh, magnetic field will get split into three and the excited state is f equal to zero so there is no splitting so now what do i do i have a magnetic field which is in this region which corresponds to this difference and the light field which is given by this red line it's not exactly on resonance both but the combined effect of absorbing these two is that there is a photon emitted with this frequency which is if i call this as pump and this as omega rf you get a photon which is at omega rf omega pump minus omega rf when you do this when it absorbs two of these photons what happens two of the electric two for when i call about photons i'm talking here about the magnetic photons so <laughs> It's a little bit crazy to think about it, but yeah, it is a magnetic field. It absorbs energy from the magnetic field here, and then it gives rise to omega p minus 2 rf. So you will get two light frequencies, which which are now at free at free have frequencies in this range. Now how do I detect them? So we go ahead and detect them by what is by optical electrodyne technique. I go and mix it with my initial pump beam already, which is being slightly shifted by AOM. which is like a local oscillator i go and beat it with that so what do i generate i ge i get the omega generated plus omega pump plus omega local oscillator now this omega generator already has omega pump min minus omega rf so basically the omega pump will get eliminated and you will have only the local oscillator plus the side bands which are at omega rf and omega 2 rf so that is what you will see as you can see here so you have the local oscillator signal and then the two signals here and interestingly the polarization state of these two signals are very different because of the difference in delta m's are different this is a zero delta m which leads to a linearly polarized pi polarized light while this one gives rise to a circularly polarized light so by choosing my polarization i can either eliminate or one or the other or have both of them depending on what i do i can generate if i pump from this of course then i will generate omega plus omega rf if i pump from here i will generate omega minus omega rf so depending on that i will have these two in different sides so again one studies what is the signal strength as a function of frequency and what is the sensitivity we get what we see is that we have as again we have sub pico tesla sensitivity over a huge range for rf measurements here we can only see rf and this is a rf magnetometer which we kind of built in the lab Uh, okay one can do the theory of this as well and then estimate what what kind of signal one has expects and we see that we actually measure exactly the same signal as we expect and what was the main thing it basically demonstrates the higher order magneto optical coupling technique typically the interesting thing is this has not really been absorbed in atomic systems these have been absorbed in material systems in solid state more in vapor states it's not been absorbed before so that was interesting and it is it turns out that it's a very sensitive rf magnetometer it can again match the rf magnetometer sensitivity of squids if they are the only competitors here and it also has a very high dynamic range and bandwidth so it can be used very nicely and uh, the resolution to the frequency of your rf is also very good it just de decided by the spectrum analyzer i used to measure the system itself has infinite resolution so what do we want to do with that with that we want to look at something called as atomic gyroscopes what are these things here typically what uh, uh, what people do is look at coupled spin systems like rubidium and xenon where xenon is a noble gas so the electron interaction of this is not very so when 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 you rubidium and xenon interact and if rubidium is already polarized electron polarized the electron polarization of rubidium gets transferred to xenon nucleus so xenon now becomes spin polarized in the sense that all the nuclear spins of xenon are aligned 
which effectively means if I put it in a bias magnetic field, all my xenon atoms will be aligned with the bias magnetic field. So now this, this all of this, let's say it's sitting in a table, and if the table rotates, of course the xenon is a gas; it's not attached to the table. So it it will its polarization will try to get the the, the magnetic field, the angle the angle between the bias field and the original xenon polarization direction will change. When that change, xenon will try to realign itself along this thing. And this itself can be probed just like we did with the, so by using the RF magnetometer that we did because that is very sensitive to the local magnetization and the xenon precession is the RF magnetic field which the rubidium will sense. So you use that and try to measure these things. These things are in some sense available not in the way we are doing it. People you do the other kind where they measure the polaris polarization rotation of rubidium and there are some commercial systems available but they are still not viable for use because their sensitivity is not good enough. Our hope is maybe because now we are measuring it with much better sensitivity with the RF magnetometer, maybe we will be able to do that. Experiments are just in progress, we still haven't really gotten there. So idea is to be able to measure this to use it for those kind of applications. This is not what we do in the lab. For completeness, I'm just going to talk about this because the person who should have talked about it is not here today, unfortunately, Kasturi Saha. But okay, so, so I'll just mention this. So, so these are the another atomic or nuclear system which is used for magnetic field sensing, which are also, as we saw, very sensitive. Sensitivity is not so great, but their resolution is very good. So for imaging applications, these are the best sensors available today. And they are interesting because these are diamonds which have nitrogen impurity in them and right next to the nitrogen impurity there is a vacancy of carbon. So it is absence of carbon which basically leads to an extra electron, it is NVE minus. So there is an extra electron present there and that has this kind of an energy structure because of group theory considerations. So this ground state has a zero field splitting which is in the microwave. And interesting thing about this is you can optically excite this using green light and it will emit red and come down to the ground state and typically what will happen is that one of them will get more populated than the other because this when whatever is excited here will go to the side and come back down here while this one will only come down here. So this, this state will get depleted and this ground state will get more. So effectively you will end up putting all of them here. And then when you put the RF, when the RF corresponds to the zero field splitting, there will be a lot of absorption. And that is what is measured. And if the local field change, and when there is a local field, this excited level split. And so instead of one line, you will get two lines. And the separation between these two lines is basically two gamma times B, where B is now the applied field. So if I just measure the splitting, I will know what is the field which is the local field. Here of course, we have put a field of 4.4 millitesla and done the experiment. But if there was, in principle, I just measure the uh, splitting and then I infer what is my field. So this is one very good way of detecting magnetic field and people are using this also for as a general magnetic field imaging device and for various testing and other applications. So yeah. And then. It. Yeah, so these can be used for magnetic field sensing. These are also spin imaging. And what is interesting is these are isolated uh, electron E minus is sitting in the NV center. So people are also exploring them for use as qubits, and they can be addressed individually or combined way. So they are also popular qubits in the modern days. Uh, this is some of the things we do in the lab. The other thing we do in the lab is this which is completely different from not sensing. Aparna has a poster. I think people maybe will be able to see that and understand some of this. I think I, I did not acknowledge the people who did the job, so I should go back and do that. Yeah. This is not all the people in the lab. These are the people involved in the work which I just presented today. So most of the work was done by these two people, George and Sushri. And we collaborated with Ashok here when we did in NICER for this thing and these are the funding agencies, basically DST, DAE and DIDO. Thank you.
Maybe I spoke too fast. You one minute early. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so we are so open more for questions. questions. So you can ask yeah. more questions. Huh. Yeah, I'll just show you the deal is, you see that, so the earth, the, what does the earth magnetic field done, it is, oh, sorry, the earth magnetic field has basically moved it away. So this is some kind of a bias. So this will be there in any case and over and above that, any change that happens, I can measure this. In, in principle, when I'm up, when there is no field or anything, I know this is the shift and I can correct for it. After that, this is the sensitive. The deal is in the absence of the earth field, as you can see for a, let's say, uh, the amount of change from there to there, if you see, total range of this is larger than this. In the sense that for a given magnetic field, I will, I will measure more Faraday rotation in the, case, in the absence of background field. In the presence of field, it is reduced, but not drastically. You can still see it. Instead of one pico tesla, I may have two pico tesla. Sensitivity, I mean. Yeah. There is no here. This is a whole setup. I'm not showing it. Basically, the Maybe before that, uh, there was a before or after. This is the experimental setup, basically. Here. Tenth, 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 tenth. Ha. So you are talking about the noise flow. Of the photo detector. These are silicon photo detectors. These are basically difference photo detectors like these, where there are two silicon photo detectors and I'm measuring the difference voltage. Okay. When light is falling, we only amplify the difference voltage. We don't look at the individuals. We, uh, you, they, are con they are connected in common mode and only the difference is amplified. Okay. So what happens is that even when there is no light falling on them, there will be some noise, which is the electronic noise, which is what we saw here. But that is very, very low. Okay. But the moment light falls on it, there is a huge noise floor. I, yeah. Maybe, okay. So that comes, and as you can also see, the noise floor is changing with frequency because the frequency response of the detector is not uniform. So at 60 hertz, there's more noise. 60 kilohertz, sorry. At, at these points, it has less noise. Okay. So this is probably also part of the reason why my curve is turning away like that because my noise floor is going up. Partly because my detector itself is performing badly. So this basically this noise floor that I have here is largely determined by my detector. I mean detector's response to the light, which is basically the photon shot noise, not the detector's problem. Detector is good by itself. <laughs> In one of the first setups, you have found that there is a, a free, there is an optimum free, a wavelength of the laser, which yeah. is okay, but there is also an optimum intensity. Yes. Uh, so after which the signal reduces. Yes. What is the reason for that? That's already shown in the theory, right? Basically, the pumping efficiency goes up, but it also probably leads to other problems of scattering and things like that. Basically, so it doesn't work that way. I mean, if you keep increasing the field, one would think that I will keep getting more and more photo, more and more optical pumping, but atom can absorb only so much light. Beyond that, if I put more light, it is not going to do anything. It's only going to do harm, if anything. It will lead to pressure broadening and things like that, which effectively will reduce my absorption in because of other reasons. Okay. My line width itself will change because of uh, light pressure. We can take rest of the questions during the coffee break. And let's thank the speaker once again. Thank you.